and orange lighting. From Squid Games to Get Out to everything, everywhere, all at once, blue and orange is everywhere in cinema these days. Today's episode covers how I get this look by mixing daylight and tungsten lighting. I'll review the theory behind why blue and orange mix so well, give you some practical tips for your own setups, and then dive into three ways that I achieve the blue and orange look in my one bedroom apartment. Make sure you stick around for the last setup. I've got some tips for those of you on a budget. The color white as we know it isn't a single point, but exists along a spectrum on a graph known as the Planckian curve. This spectrum is known as color temperature, and we use units of Kelvin to describe where our white point exists along it from warm at the lower end of the spectrum to cool at the higher. The color white we imagine when we think of white is one specific point along the spectrum at 5600 Kelvin. This is also known in film as daylight or having daylight balanced lights. Tungsten sits at a lower point along this spectrum, 3200 Kelvin, which is why it appears orange or warmer than traditional daylight when they're viewed together. Because our cameras don't adjust naturally like our eyes do, we need to adjust the color temperature ourselves in camera with a setting that's usually called white balance. Most cameras go from at least 2700 to 7000 K, with the standard daylight value being at 5600 Kelvin. Parts of a scene that are lit with lights having a higher color temperature than the white balance in the camera will appear blue, with the blue saturation increasing as temperature increases. Anything in frame below the white balance setting will appear orange. So we know what color temperature is and why white isn't just one shade, but why does this matter in film? Well, mixed color temperatures happen all the time around us in obvious and not so obvious ways. For example, the winter sky I'm experiencing right now in Colorado measures 5600 Kelvin in the sun, but is actually around 8000 Kelvin in the shade. Notice the difference here in the same piece of paper taken with the same camera temperature setting. One reason why mixing color temperatures in frame looks so pleasing is due to some basic color theory. In case you've never seen a color reel before, this is a color wheel. Colors that are directly across from each other are known as complementary colors and can be a good starting point for deciding which hues will pair well together. Notice that blue and orange are across from each other on this wheel. It's this part of color theory that we're taking advantage of when we combine mixing color temperatures and the white point settings on a camera to achieve the blue and orange look. If you have lights that only output at one color temperature, don't worry. There's these things called color correction gels which kind of do exactly what the name implies. They correct the color of the lighting so that you can get them to match the white point of your camera. They're available in orange or blue and a full strength one will either adjust a daylight balance light to tungsten or vice versa. You can also get them in half, quarter or eighth strengths to fit the mood you're going for. A single sheet runs a couple bucks and can last a while if properly taken care of. And by using these gels, we can even push a daylight colored light cooler than 5600 Kelvin or a tungsten light warmer than 3200 Kelvin. Without RGB colored lights, this is definitely the cheapest way to get blue or orange tones on set. Let's rewind a sec and review some of these key points. The color white exists along a spectrum known as color temperature and is measured in units called Kelvin. Low values appear orange or warm and higher values appear blue or cool. Daylight comes in at 5600 Kelvin while tungsten is at 3200 Kelvin. By manipulating the white balance setting on our camera, we can make our scene appear more blue or orange in camera. Mixing blue and orange is pleasing to our eye because they are across from each other on the color wheel, what's known as complementary colors. Without having RGB lighting, the best way that we can add blue and orange tones to our scene is by using color correction gels that come in varying strengths. Combining what we just learned about color temperature being along a spectrum, what we know about basic color theory, a few gels or colored lights, and the color temperature settings on our cameras, let's get into the practical application of how this works on a film set. Because control is the most important aspect of good lighting, the first thing that I'll do when I get onto set is I'll change any existing light sources that are affecting the scene in a way I don't like. This may include opening or closing windows, adjusting doors, turning on or off room lights, or even blocking smaller sources of light. Another way I achieve good separation between the subject and background of a frame is by feathering the key light. Most people will aim their key light directly at the subject, but this isn't how to get the most control from a modifier or achieve the softest possible lighting. What I do instead is I'll do what you'd normally do, place my key light where it's going to live and point it at my subject, but I don't stop there. I'll then begin to rotate the light until just the edge of the light is hitting my subject. I'm rotating the light in whichever direction causes it to impact the scene less while still keying the subject, which is generally away from the background of the scene. Once I've rotated my key light to where I'm losing exposure on the subject, I bring it back a little bit 
And now I've got a feathered key light. It's easier to do this with a grid than without a grid for more control, but the concept still applies either way. Feathering is one of the key ways that I'm able to mix color temperatures, even in smaller spaces. It allows me to maintain a distinct separation between lights that are for my subject and those that are for my background, and is how I begin to shape a moody cinematic look. Separate lights for each element in frame also allows me greater control when working with a DP. Another way to control the lights in a scene is to use a modifier that limits the beam angle of that light. The reflector that comes with most LEDs is a basic example of this, as it limits the spread of the light to around 55 degrees from being open face. If you want to place a softbox on a light to make that light softer, then to control it, you'll need to use what's called a grid. It's this boxy looking thing that Velcros onto the front of your softbox after you've placed your diffusion screen. Because of all of the squares, it has a similar effect to a reflector and reduces the beam angle to usually around 55 degrees also. Before we talk about the lighting setups, I'd love it if you give this video a like and give me a follow if you're not already. I can see that most of you who watch these videos aren't subscribed yet, and it really helps smaller channels like mine to grow and be seen in the algorithm. It also means you won't miss any more lighting tutorials like this. On to the first of our lighting setups, let's go over how I lit this interview. Generally for interviews, I'm lighting my talent with a daylight balanced light, so in order to introduce some warmth to this scene, I added some tungsten coloration to the background. There's two lights that I've used to create the orange background glow. I've put an incandescent bulb in a lamp that you can see on the left. This gives motivation for the actual light filling out the background, which is an Amaran F22C set to 2700 Kelvin and positioned just out of frame. One reason I use incandescent bulbs is because some LED bulbs will flicker in camera when dimmed. Incandescent bulbs have a richer output across the visible light spectrum, which helps the camera sensor with more accurate color reproduction. I've plugged this light into a dimmer switch from my local hardware store so that I can dim it to where it isn't blowing out in the highlights and causing a loss of color data. Because I've dimmed the light though, the output is rather minimal. This is what the setup looks like with only the lamp turned on. This is why I'm supplementing this lamp, my motivated lighting with an additional lighting source that's just out of frame. This combination of the two gives me more control over the levels in a scene and, when done properly, looks natural to the eye. Using practicals like this, house lamps, street lamps, etc., to add motivation to the lighting in a scene helps to ground the lighting in reality. Here's how this scene looks without the bulb and just the off-frame light on. Feels a little off, right? Why is there an orange glow but the lamp's not on? Speaking of our off-frame light, the Amaran F22C was positioned just out of frame and placed at a height that would match the lamp on the table. I placed a grid on it to give it directionality towards the background and keep from spilling on my face. Here's what this scene looks like without a grid on this light. Notice the orange glow that's appeared on the side of my face that wasn't there before. The main light that I used, called the key light, was an Aperture 300D Mark II with an Aperture Light Dome 2 softbox. I combined a grid and feathering with this light so I'm able to shine it on me without having it spilling on the background. Here's what this setup looks like without a grid on the key and without me feathering the light. Notice how much more washed out the background background has become compared to before. Lastly, I've got one light creating separation between me and the background. A four foot tube is adding some brightness to an otherwise dark part of the frame and is adding this nice highlight on my cheek while maintaining a small footprint necessary for the space. If you're familiar with three point lighting setups, this light is acting as my rim or my kicker light. Here's what this setup looks like without this light. And if you prefer the look without this light, that's great too. That's the fun and creative part of lighting. Let's move on to lighting setup number two, a tighter one person frame where I'm watching and TV at night. My key light is an Aperture 300D Mark II with a light dome 2 shining through a full strength color temperature orange gel. I chose the light dome 2 specifically because while slightly pricey, it comes with a gel holder built into it so I can use my smaller gel squares rather than having to buy these giant pieces to put in front of the modifier. I placed this very specifically at an angle to get just a slight hint of orange on the shadow side of my face which helped give some shape to it without being too moody and dramatic. I feathered this light as well, so there wasn't a large hot spot on the wall behind my head that would draw the viewer's attention away from my face. An Amaran F22C provides the orange glow on the wall that you see on screen left. I used this to mimic an incandescent bulb like the first setup, and having two different lights for the warm look gives me independent control for the brightness levels between my face and the wall. Here's what this setup looks like with just the key light, and with just the wall light showing. A four foot tube provides the moon ambiance that you see on the near side of my face and in the shadows. This light was set horizontally to increase the softness on my face and given a slight blue tone because that's what Hollywood has led us to believe that moonlight looks like in cinema. Lastly, 
The TV gag is a two foot tube using a programmed effect. I've placed this horizontally to better mimic the soft output of a TV and positioned it close enough so that you could see the catch light of it in my eyes, which helps sell the TV effect even more. I balance the output so that the gag is obvious at first glance without overpowering the blue and orange look that I've created. All right, all right, all right. On to the final lighting setup. Let's break down how I lit this cozy evening script writing scene. One of the keys to good cinematography is having depth in frame. So the first thing that I did was pull my dining table away from the wall. This enabled me to shoot more directly into the corner while also catching empty space and random lights outside the window to add to the depth. Here's the angle I would have had to use if I had left the table in place or shot towards the opposite corner. Way too much white wall to ever look good in frame for me. To give motivation for the key light, I placed an aperture B7C into a lamp this time. It's tuned to 2700K to mimic the output of an incandescent bulb, and I made sure to dim this so it wasn't blowing out in the highlights again. Make sure that you dim this through the app or bulb controls and not through a dimmer. These bulbs will flicker if they're not provided the required amount of power. An Amaran F22C placed just above the B7C is our key light this time again. A grid helps give the key light some directionality and keep it from mixing with the background light on the wall on the left. In order to make positioning this light easier, I've replaced the rear receiver on it because the one that it comes with doesn't work with all of my standard grip hardware. I'll link a video down in the description that will walk you through this process so you can do it yourself. An Aperture 300 D2 with Light Dome 2 does double duty. It fills in the background with our moonlight glow and also acts as a kicker for me, which you can see here. I placed a full CTB gel in this to bring the light well past 10,000 Kelvin and bring a bit of a blue hue to the scene. Lastly, an Aperture 60X with Mini Spotlight is hanging out on my deck, casting the hard beam across the wall that you can see to give some interest to the background. I set this to 6500K so that it's as close as I could get it to the blue hue of the moon. An important note for this scene, I tuned my camera to a white balance of 4000 Kelvin for this shot, which pushed more blue into the background light while still maintaining an orange glow from the bulb and key light. The tip you waited for the end for, if you are just starting to acquire your own lights, here's how you can get similar results for less than $400. The GVM 80 watt kit on Amazon comes with a light, stand, modifier, and grid for about 170, so let's snag two of these for 340. Two gels off of B&H will run you about $20 after shipping, and it's also a good idea to have some close hangers or smaller clips on hand because the modifiers that these lights come with won't have gel holders built in. Here's what this scene looks like if I replace the Amran F22C and Aperture 300D that I originally used with the 80 watt GVM lights, some inexpensive modifiers, and gels. If you replace the B7C with an incandescent bulb and dimmer, another $20. We've got a very similar look to the original one for a whole lot less. Let me know down in the comments the next scene that you're gonna light with these techniques. I wanna hear how you're being creative with your setups. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.